Welcome to episode two of season 10, A Talking Time with Caffeine. My, my guests are still running late here, but first of all, y'all know him, y'all love him, unless, unless, you're, unless you hate him. Introduce yourself. Uh, hello, my name is Jackson Wheat. I run a YouTube channel, uh, which is just Jackson Wheat, uh, where I teach concepts in evolutionary biology and zoology predominantly, and sometimes I'll do... Uh, interviews or guest appearances things like that right hey uh jay uh rj jackson wants to know if you're coming in you thought you were if your internet can handle it come on in if not yeah rj get in here if you're listening the internet works we know they're putting fresh batteries in this powerpoint rj come on in here get in here um, so today we're talking about monotremes. Yes, our most distant cousin that can still be considered a mammal. Yeah, they're um, they're they're strange mammals, uh, but they meet all the criteria for mammals. And so I guess I will screen share for the PowerPoint. I'll stick here in the oh RJ. I was hoping you'd be in here. I thought you were. Yes. Okay. Now a lot of people think when they when they think of mammals, they think of live births, but that's not necessarily the case. Exactly right. Um, because technically the definition of a mammal is um is having um fur or hair, lactal mammaries, and oops, I think I Stop sharing. Uh, it's having hair, fur, lactal mammaries, and three middle ear bones. Those are the definitive traits for being a mammal, not necessarily giving live birth. Um, because, as we shall see, not all mammals give live birth. And that is especially the case for a lot of fossil mammals. Um, let me try that again. Okay. Can you see my screen? <clears throat> yes. Yes, I can. Okay, so we're going to talk about monotremes. So monotreme, uh, the word itself, mono, means one, and trem refers, means, so it means one opening. And this refers to the fact that they have a cloaca, which is their single opening for urinary, digestive, and reproductive tracts. Um, so, and that's that's also the, the case for birds, uh, reptiles, and amphibians. Um and so, of course, the the since since mammals are derived from reptiles, it makes sense that that the early mammals would also have a cloaca. Um, and so, this this um, condition of having a single opening for these different or these different um, uh, bodily systems, this was changed, but only relatively recently. So. Um, after the split between monotremes and the marsupials and placental mammals, the marsupials and placentals are collectively called therians, and ther and uh, theria just means mammal. And so eutheria means the, or, or I think theria technically means beast, if I remember correctly. Um, and then eutheria, which is just the placental mammals, means the true beast. Yeah, that that doesn't include that's not including the the marsupials are more closer cousins. Right, right, e exactly. Um, so yeah, so this this um, this character state is only changed for the Therians. They have separate exits for the uh, urinary and digestive tracts, and we'll actually talk about the developmental biology of that in a moment. It's very interesting. Um, so and yeah, so here here's the. Uh, I mean, we'll see a picture of it. We're going to talk about it right now. Um, so yeah, so actually during the ontogeny, that is the, the development from like, you know, an embryo to a fetus to, um, to, to being born, um, the actual, the, the separation of that single tract into two is replayed. Uh, so you can sort of think back to that whole ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny idea, what, which Heckel had which was wrong, broadly speaking, it was wrong, or is wrong, organisms don't display the adult, or they don't go through the adult um, 
uh, character states for their ancestors. It's more like they go through the embryological stages of their ancestors, which is what Von Baer proposed, uh, who was sort of the the opponent to Heckel. And of course, Von Baer was more correct. I mean, he had some incorrect ideas too uh, regarding embryology, but he was more right than Heckel was. And that sort of led to kind of the modern idea of like the, the phylotypic stage, why all the, the vertebrates have very similar embryo, have very similar embryos. Um, and again, that's kind of a topic for another time because there's a lot yeah. of variation that goes into that as well. But um, just broadly speaking, and we'll look at a picture of it in a moment. So the penis, which the males have, of course, um, and also lots of reptiles have penises, um, is it's just used for reproduction. Is only the the uh, tra is only the the exit in males for the reproductive system, not for the urinary system as it is in Therians. And then, uh, and so uh, to continue with, we're talking. You know, everything's gross right now, so we'll continue with that. Uh, <laughs> Um, so as for the, the other side of that, oh, are we getting comments? Do we get no. any comments? No. Okay. Uh, this, oh, oh, this, except for this one. Oh, what do they say? This little mammal reminds me of a lot of a porcupine for some odd reason. Oh, uh, yes. Version. Yeah. We'll get to that in a sec. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll talk about the, um, the echidna in a moment or in a little bit. So milk. Um, so they do have, they have lactal mammaries as all mammals do. Um, but monotremes don't have uh, nipples. The The babies don't suckle from nipples. They uh, basically, the, the mother excretes milk from these. I mean, uh, the, the lactal mammaries, the glands that produce milk, they're just essentially modified sweat glands. You're just, you're sweating milk through a particular pore, basically. And with these guys, what you're doing is they are secreting it kind of through their skin rather than through one particular opening. And so um, and so you might think, well, since these guys are so primitive compared to the other mammals, maybe having the milk pads was the ancestral state and having a nipple is the derived state. Well, interestingly, um, mammals did actually originally have nipples, but it, they became uh, uh, lactal pads in the monotremes later so this is secondarily derived uh not not the primitive state do you have a question though yes on your, on your fourth point is the penis is only used for reproduction is it used for other things in other animals or something yeah i mean we use ours as the exit for our urinary tract oh okay um but yeah the 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 monotremes don't use the penis as the exit for the urinary tract. They just use it for reproduction. Okay. I thought, I thought, I thought I was thinking like, maybe like a weapon or something. Oh, like penis fencing or something, which does happen in uh, uh, sea slugs. Sea slugs, which are hermaphrodites, will actually fence with their penises. They're like swords, and they'll just stab each other repeatedly until one of one or both of them are inseminated, and then they leave. Uh, wait, something to get to, to talk about if you ever get, get to that clade of, clade of animals. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> Cyphopteron quadrispinosum was one of the first examples. No, uh, talk to my cat, uh, was one of the first examples of penis fencing I, I read about. And, and there was a paper that was like uh, traumatic mating is what, what it was called. So, um, all right, are we good on this slide or are we ready for the next one? Yeah, oh, the, the, the cloak, yeah, that, that's on those animals. Plus uh, the reptiles and birds, that's where it all comes out one one slot, right? The babies, yes. the poop, the pee, the whole nine yep. yards. Yeah, it's all just this one. And it's the same. I mean, fish also have, um, you know, just the one exit for uh, reproductive and digestive tracts. So. so, so, so that like on the, on the, on the, on the, so on the, uh, Animals that the other animals besides the besides the mammals, the Google library, like some snakes, some some frogs, you know, some fish, correct? Some, like the like the uh ichiosaurs and stuff, the marine reptiles, it go uh, they give birth through that thing, yes, yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. Um, so interestingly, switching back and forth between like um laying eggs and giving live birth is apparently not that hard because lots and lots and lots of different lineages have done it. Um, and some of them even switched, you know, back again, like they may have been egg layers originally, 
then switch to placenta and then switch back to egg laying. They, you know, they just go back and forth because um, for whatever reason, it's not that difficult to do. And so uh, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, ichthyosaurs, uh, they're, they're fish that uh, give live birth, like sharks and uh, give live birth. Uh, or I think some sharks give live birth. Uh, not all of them, per se. Um, many of them lay like mermaids' purses and that sort of stuff. Um, there are lots of snakes that do it. And yeah, you mentioned frogs. Uh, some some frogs uh, they they basically skip the tadpole stage. They go straight to froglet, um, and that's how you're able to skip um, laying eggs. Is they basically direct develop. Um, I talked a little bit about that in a video I did for Prophet of Zod once. Um, I don't remember the title of the video, but I was I made a guest oh. appearance over there. Well, and if, was fun. If, I, if I can find it, I'll put I'll put up a, a uh, what's it called a card up, up above right now for that. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, it wasn't super long ago. Uh, maybe it was like in February, something like that. Anyways, all right. A February is that a year ago at this point almost. Oh, you're right. It was. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was a year, about a year ago. Um, all right. We ready for the next one? Yes. Okay. So sort of building off what I was talking about with the ontogeny. Um, so here, so a picture a here, this is what it, this is. So you have the anus, which is down here at the bottom. So that's the, the exit for both your digestive and uh, then you see it says urinary bladder. So your digestive and urinary tracts. So they both exit there. This is early in, in your um, uh, early in your your uh, development, your ontogeny. And then you see this divide starting to happen. Uh, metanephros and your reader, I believe that. So I think the metanephros is the the start of the kidney development. I think. I think that's like the bud of the kidney sort of beginning. Um. And you see by part C, this divide has really started and then it's complete or is, is really happening. And then by D, it is complete and you have two completely separate um, urinary and digestive tracts. So really interesting to think about that they were just one. And then over time, they got continually separated uh, until and, uh, you know, until now we have these two exits and. The whole thing is replayed as we as we develop. Um, there are some other interesting little bits like that that replay as we develop. Like for instance, um, what is it like? Part of our jaws um, ossify in the manner that it occurred in like the synapsids earlier synapsids. Okay. Um, uh, whales also will develop like their limb buds and then they recede. Uh, stuff like that happens. The whales develop teeth that recede. Um, I think snakes also develop like little limb buds that then recede. So, so yeah. Um, I just thought so, that was really cool. So is that like the, when they're developing in, in the womb right there? Or, or yes. Are those stages? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so. I don't know if it was that was developing the womb stages or those were like the transitional <clears throat> Fossil phase, well, I realize. Um, I never, you can't have transitional fossils of or, organs, can you? Or yeah, I don't know if this... I'm not sure if this would have played out exactly this way in animal evolution because the kidneys were already around. Um, so I don't know if it would have played out exactly this way, but but this is how it happens in development. You see this this original um, this original position and now then the highly derived position at the very end. All right, are we good on that? Are we ready for the next one? I believe so. Okay. Okay, and then I'm going to make this one large so that we can sort of zoom in here because I understand uh, or realize some of the words are tiny. Okay, so... Um, all right, so uh, at the very top, we have uh, um, early mammal or not even mammals. They're, they're mammalia forms. Oh. So they're outside the mammals. Um, so the, the purple and the blue up there, those are mammalia forms. They're, they're very, very close to being mammals, but not quite there yet. Oh, I, I see. I see some of them have got the, uh, the, the gliding gene too, way back then too. 
Oh, okay. So that's the thing. Velavicatherium may be a glider, may not be. There's been a lot of debate on that, and it's not settled. Um, there are hints that maybe Velaticatherium was a glider. Uh, but that that um arboreal lifestyle is not known for certain. I'll say that. There okay. there have been debates about that. Um uh, yeah, if you look at the very top, like Thernaxodon, Probanagnathus, those are still the like double hinged jaw joint guys. So we don't have quite the the total single mammalian jaw joint yet. Oh, but but they're past the th the therapsid and cyanodont stages. Just by this point. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's like in the cyanodonts, the the purple at least, because um, you're in the early Triassic, yeah, Triassic, and then. Then you have the last common ancestor of mammals sometime in the early Jurassic. And so the true mammals, you have the green, which are the the monotremes and their relatives, which um, were previously called the prototheres or prototherians. They're now called the Australosphenidans. Um, I don't really know what the exact cladistic difference is, but we're just going with this for the sake of argument. Um, so basically from green downward, that's those are all true true mammals um and so so there used to be more uh more monotremes and their relatives but they have mostly been out competed yeah i i guess uh carrying your baby for longer than, than laying an egg is i guess that's more of a benefit i guess where that most, most of them are living yeah yeah it certainly could be um for whatever reason, um, I don't know what the exact gestation time is for um, for monotremes and, and marsupials, um, but yeah. So I, I think it, I think it's probably less to do with the reproductive time per se, because I think they give birth sooner. Yeah, they do. Um, but it's probably they're probably less developed when they're when they're born. Um, as opposed to a lot of placental mammals, um, so like what I like, would... yeah, like 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 most. I think I think we're the only ones that they can't walk walk around when we're born. I think most other, other placental mammals can, for the most part, except for whales. They can swim around. Yeah, a lot of them. A lot of them can. They're um, they're uh, what is it? Altricial, I think, uh, or precocial. Sorry, they're precocial. We are altricial. Um, that means that, you know, they, they can yeah walk basically right after they're born. Um, and then this kind of this yellow group here, those guys are all extinct. Um, let's see, like Rapinomammus. Rapinomammus is actually a very interesting fossil. That's that really kind of chunky guy, um, up there by kind of by the green line. And Rapinomammus was actually found, uh, to have, um, Cetacosaurus offspring in its gut. When it, when it died, so so, so uh, I, don't know you, I, I don't know if this is later in your thing or is, you know, but, but is is was there was it just coincidence that both the monotremes and the marsupials all ended up in the same area? Wander, their their journeys took them to the same Australia type area, except for except for the uh, possum that is this is America. We will talk about the the biogeography momentarily. Okay. Yeah, that's on the next all slide. Right. Um, then of course down there in the red, those are the eutherians and including the placental mammals. And then the, the blue guys down at the bottom are the marsupials. So, so there you go. Um, so the weird, the really weird or the, the features that, um, made people think in the 1800s that, that, um, the platypus was just a hoax. They're actually very normal for early mammals, like laying eggs. That's a completely normal character for early mammals. We just don't. For Consider all that mammals because until we, we split off from the egg layers. Right, exactly. All mammals laid eggs until like the Jurassic, basically. Um, and so yeah, so for a while, yeah, th that was the that was not only the, the norm, it was the only. And then it wasn't until later when uh uh giving live birth became the norm, and then we just happened to have come about in that world. Yeah. And so it was really weird for people to sort of rediscover the, the, the platypus. And they're like, wow, this is weird. So yeah. I, um, anything else on this one? 
Uh, I can't think of anything. If my chat has anything to talk about, they can, they can bring it up. But I think I'm good for this slide. Okay. All right. So, so biogeography. So you raised a good question. You're always you're always predicting my slides. Um, um, so actually, all of the um, all of the the uh, monotreme uh, fossils, I guess the core monotremes, come from either like uh, very southern South America or Antarctica or Australia. Uh, which makes sense because these continents were all part of Gondwana in the uh, in the Cretaceous. And so marsupials, yeah, both marsupials and um, monotremes kind of ended up in South America and then made their way across Antarctica into Australia. Uh, that might not be a coincidence. I mean, so here's the thing about that, though, is it's not like there were no placental mammals in South America while it was isolated, they were noto ungulates, for instance. They were in South America, like the whole Cenozoic, pretty much. Um, marsupials took on lots of different forms. There were some like big carnivores, like Thylacosmilus, in um, in South America, and then in Australia there was like Thylaca leo, the the marsupial lion. So yeah, there were some some pretty serious marsupial predators for a long time. So. I don't know what what precise evolutionary pressure, you know, caused their their downfall, um, per se, but but they were pretty much totally restricted to Gondwana. That's where they survived, and that's where they continue to survive today. Um, echidnas and and the platypus, because they're they're four species of echidna, they're only found in like New Guinea and Australia, and uh, there's a very famous. Um, dividing point between Asia and uh, or between basically the Asian fauna and the Australian fauna. Do you know what that that dividing line is called? I think I've heard, I've heard of it before. I can't think the name of it though. Yeah, you, pro you probably have. It's called Wallace's Line. Named after Alfred Russell Wallace who was the uh, co-discoverer of natural selection. So while Darwin was discovering or was studying finches in the Galapagos, but technically he didn't know they were finches at the time. Um, Wallace was studying the fauna of New Guinea and Java and Sumatra, the what they call the, the Malaysian archipelago. And so um, so Wallace was studying the animals there and he was kind of like, huh, it's weird that there are like marsupials and monotremes on in New Guinea, but there are apes and tigers and elephants in Sumatra. What's up with that? And yeah. And and so he kind of elucidated that. And of course, it wasn't until plate tectonics came along that you know researchers sort of made sense of all that. The, the like the 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 light birth people went one what what continental drift and then the and the egg layers went the other way. Yeah, basically that's that's basically uh well um it's more like um Australia as as you can see here it's like so it kind of separated from Antarctica so that was all Gondwana and it shifted northwards and so as it shifted northwards um got closer and closer to the the laurasian fauna and the afrotherian fauna which was in asia um but there are some really deep uh, bodies of water between these different islands and so probably has discouraged uh, crossing events all right uh, are we good on this one uh i think so Oh, I think also, so. I, I guess one other thing I can draw your attention to is you see Monotrematum and Obduridon, they look like the platypus, like the modern platypus, which is Ornithorhynchus. So the, the platypus is kind of a living fossil in a sense. Okay. It looks a lot like the the ancient monotremes. The echidna is, is very derived, but the platypus looks a lot more like the ancient monotremes. So, question that doesn't even quite these things are these like like extinct cousins of the platypus, or they're like what's the word? Yeah, like the transitional fossils of the platypus. I mean, you know, all transitional fossils are, are cousins, 
of, true, true. of others. So because, since since we can't know until we get DNA, until we get some DNA fossils, we can't really know for certain which ones are ancestors, which ones are are right. extent versions. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, in a sense you could say these are like transitional platypuses, but they, you know, kind of look a lot like the modern platypus. So all right. And then extant taxa. So like I said, there are four species of echidnas and they look kind of like little porcupines. It's probably a defensive mechanism. They can also ball up sort of like armadillos. Um, they have these big claws uh, for, for digging for like insects. And they have a long tongue, which they can also use to catch insects. So uh, sort of like an anteater. So these are both. So both these are, are there, both these are insectivores. Um. Yeah, sort of. I mean, the the platypus eats like little freshwater invertebrates, not necessarily okay. insects per se, like a uh, crawfish, things like that. Okay, little lobsters, um, and then which will, you know, of course, also it does include insects, and then the echidna. Yeah, and so both are both eat lots of little arthropods. Um, so, so there's no there's no herbivore, at least at least in living terms, no herbivore monotremes. Then, no. No, yeah, they're both insectivores. Um, the so a couple a couple features I want to draw your attention to. So one thing people call the platypus the duck billed platypus. Uh, well, so there's kind of a problem with that. It's the, it's the and actually, well, I'll tell you about this creationist. Um, you you probably know about it, but your audience may not. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So the thing about the platypus is. Part of the reason that naturalists or that you know, people in general in the 1800s thought that it was a fake when it was first brought from Australia is, I mean, look at it. It looks, it looks weird. It looks like it has a, a duck bill and webbed feet like a duck. You know, it's got a beaver tail. It doesn't make any sense. Right. And it lays eggs. I mean, what's up with that? It's basically a, a bird mammal hybrid. Right. But of, of course, yeah. as we mentioned. Yeah. Let's be a point that I used to think a long time ago. I, I, th Back before I knew more about this uh, cladistics and finality and stuff, mm -hmm. I used to I used to actually think that birds were more related to mammals than other animals because of the platypus. Ah, yeah, well, but um, yeah, both birds and yeah mammals are descended from egg laying mammals, and so they, these guys are just doing what they're what our all of our ancestors did. They're still just laying eggs like normal. Um, the, the web feet, which only the platypus have, the echidnas, they don't really... I think echidnas can swim, but they really don't do it that much. Um, if you look at the at the, the the feet, the webbed feet of the platypus, you notice the toes don't go all the way to the end of the webbing. The webbing extends way beyond the toes. And so so it's, it's not really like a duck's webbing, because duck feet the toes really do go to the end they're actually claws on the end of the duck's toes so um it's it's only this superficial sort of resemblance because of course having this webbing creates uh this this pad so you can cr get more uh thrust as you swim through the water same with the tail so so back to our one episode we did last year is this like almost like a transition to go into the full time the water almost because it like the looks like the platypus don't look, when it looks like now the platypus wouldn't walk very well on land that that well. I mean, sure, yeah, you know, and it's very adapted for a life of searching for aquatic invertebrates in the mud. Um, so yeah, it's it's very well adapted for that. Um, I mean, whales also went through a period where their tail was kind of like a beaver, a, a beaver's. Mm. Um, and again, the reason for that is it helps get thrust. You have this big flat tail and you push and it gives you a, a big uh, thrust through the water. And so, yeah, they're getting pushed both from their tail and from their flippers or their, 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 their hands, their little, I guess you could call them flippers. You know what, you know what I'm talking about? They're, they're webbed yeah. hands. Um, so yeah, yeah, they're, they're very well adapted for, for a semi-aquatic life. Um, and I think their fur is pretty thick too, so it also helps insulate them. And and the, of course the the big feature that you know people talk about is, and what people call them for is, is their bill. 
it's yeah. a duck's bill, except it's not a duck's bill. It's really totally not at all like a duck's bill. <laughs> made, totally, made totally different materials. Exactly. It is made of totally different material. It's made from fleshy skin rather than hard keratin like a like a duck. Um, also, the way that the mouth uh, the mouth uh, opens from the bottom. Um, it uh, well, let me rephrase that. Duck duck beaks are two separate pieces. Um, where and so like when they open their mouth, both pieces separate. Um, that's not what happens here. It's like the the bottom jaw is like uh is is like part of the bill rather than being a separate piece of the bill. So yeah, totally separate material, totally different mechanism of opening. Um, so it really just looks um, superficially similar, but also the bill, the duck bill, or the, the, the platypus bill, is full of electroreceptors. And uh, biologists have sort of figured out that the platypus uses most of its brain power for interpreting those electroreceptor signals. Now, interestingly, the echidna, you can see his little bill also, he also has electroreceptors in there. Uh, they're not not nearly as, as great as the platypuses, but he does also have them. So, all right. Um, but yeah, so and then of course there's only one species of platypus, and so um, okay, so I'll tell you the story about the creationists. So a while back, I guess that was two years ago now. Good lord. Ugh. <sighs> I'm getting too old for this now. Um, there was a creationist that we were sparring with on my channel. His name was Long Story Short. Oh, guy, I remember that series. Yeah, so this guy, uh, for your audience, so um, he worked for the Discovery Institute. I think he still works for them. He still puts out videos for them. And they're, they're well animated, but they're very terrible informationally. So we had a series of back and forths with him. And he says... Um, that the idea of the nested hierarchy of animals or of life generally is it's just it's not real it's not true uh, and he's like oh there are so many examples of organisms that that don't conform to the nested hierarchy now the funny thing is if you look at a if you look at genes there are lots of different ways that genes will not conform perfectly to a nested hierarchy and in fact my next video uh, we'll discuss that a little bit uh, but by and large, for animals at least, or for eukaryotes, most of them do conform to the nest, or they, they do conform pretty much entirely to the nested hierarchy. And and you can look at their genes to confirm that. Well, so we asked them, you know, give us an example in your mind of, of an organism that doesn't conform to the nested hierarchy. And his response, no joke, was the platypus. Like, this is still the 1800s, and it's a chimeric animal. And he seriously defended that, like, the platypus is like an actual chimera. And it was stupid. And people watched that video, and in the comment section, they're like, wow, what a great argument he made. <laughs> oh, it was just so dumb. It was so hilariously... There were so many things he said that were hilariously dumb, and... And yet he's well respected by the Discovery Institute, which just goes to show you it's not about facts. It's about feels over reels. So at any rate, I won't give him any more of my time or our time. So, all right. Um, uh, do we have questions from the audience? Well, that's all? All the slides? Yeah, I mean, there aren't really a whole lot of... Okay. I do have a question. I, I do have a question, though. Where was that Platypus's top hat? Exactly. Where's his little, uh, his like bowler hat or whatever? <laughs> Agent P. <laughs> there was a, a video. I think it may have been on TikTok. Uh, my sister showed me where the the voice actor for Doctor Doofenshmirtz was sent a. Uh, he was sent like a drawing of a platypus. He said, "Oh look, it's a cute little platypus." And then the and then like the next one, it's a platypus with the. The little agent had he's like oh, Perry the platypus. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. Oh so, what I, a great show. 
What a anybody, great show. So anybody have any questions that are watching right now? RJ, do you have any questions? Is, is RJ still with us? Is he still there? It's, he, he had two comments. The first comment was this. I suspect uh, they were specialists in rare niches, while the more diverse, but ultimately extinct, dominant late therapsis mm -hmm. got favored in the fossil preservation. Game. That's probably true. That's probably true. And then, and that electroreceptor wiring hog space above the jaw, resulting in tendency for toothlessness. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, that, that's probably why um, they are insectivores. Uh, you know, no bones because they're toothless. And so it's just a matter of crushing um, arthropods with that beak. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, there was a there's a picture. I think it's. I, or I mean, it's in the ancestors' tale, um, and there have been other pictures of it, like a little homunculus of how much space of the brain is taken up um, for the electroreception. It's like it's the vast majority of it. It's a lot. <laughs> you know. You know. Yeah. Go ahead. You, you, you brought up your next video talking about that the hierarchies and stuff. Would that be the bonobo's tale? That your next video? Absolutely correct. That is the bonobo's tale. Yeah, we're going to talk about. Uh, well, I guess I'll. Um, I guess I can Spo tell you what we've already talked about. I won't won't spoil it for you. Yeah. Um, but in the last video, the chimpanzee's tale, we talked. We mentioned sort of in passing at the very end that about a third of the gorilla's genes are either more similar to chimps or bonobos or humans than to the others. How could that be possible? Well, you're going to find out how that's possible in the next video. It'll be very fun. It's already, it's uh, the script is done for it or for my end is done. It's getting edited by all our favorite people. Uh, RJ, Erica, Nestling, and then uh, it's just a matter of recording at that point. So I, no, you bring this up, but I, I say this too that we don't have we don't have to worry about that that much because we have we have we, we, with the placentals we get the inner, we get the nutrients right from right from our mommy. But even with even with uh, monotre monotremes, their 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 yolk part yolk sac is extremely small. That's why they're born quickly. Okay. Yes, yeah, you're right. It's so yeah. There was this um this loss this this reduction in the yolk sac. Um, and so, yeah, theirs is pretty small. So like uh, birds and reptiles, the um, the egg divides along like the yolk sac. Um, it goes through meroblastic uh, division instead of holoblastic uh, division, like, like what placental mammals do and marsupials. And so, yeah, so it's because the, at, by the time you get to us, the, the egg sac is, so reduced it doesn't even really function anymore um and we we do still have the uh the broken genes the pseudo genes for uh what is it vitelligen i think which is one of the proteins in the yolk sac so yeah so um so yeah we still have the remnants of our reptilian ancestry in us you know but it's, it's just by this point it's just useless this is useless useless yeah, exactly that's a a fossil. Would that be considered a what's that? What's that word? Uh, oh God, I can't remember the word now. But like, like the tailbone and the like the tailbone and vestigial. Uh, yeah, that's the word. Uh, yeah. I mean, in a sense, it's vestigial. Um, it's the the technical genetic term for it is a pseudo gene because it's no longer functional. But yeah, it's vestigial. Um, I think vestigial usually applies more to like uh, morphological structures rather than like genes. But yeah, okay. it's, I mean, it, it's still, yeah, it's because it's so reduced that it, it's basically reduced to, to nothing, essentially. I, 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 like, to, I like to see creations come, come up with a, 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 like, that's still useful. It's just the blah, blah, blah thing, like they do, like they do with the whale legs. <sighs> yeah, the, the Vitelligen thing, I, I'm trying to remember, I think their argument with that is like, oh, well, you don't know if it's being used for something else. Yeah, we do. It's, you can test it on tissues. We know it's not being used. It's a pseudogene. Get over it. Move on. Um, which is funny because, like, the 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 problem with creationist arguments is they don't think them through. The genetic entropy necessitates that genes are being lost, right? If we mm -hmm. if our genome is degrading, 
we're losing genes or alleles or something, yeah. but they're like, we're losing stuff. What stuff? What are we losing? Well, they don't really tell you because they don't have but, a model. But Jackson, if we're losing something, that's not evolution. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's it's not evolution and it's not genetic entropy. It's just happening, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I think someone said once it's, it's more of a balance. If if like like egg laying it was more important than than whatever that natural selection type thing, whatever needs more energy or less energy or something like that, I forget which way it yeah. went, is more is more uh, pr productive or more required. I forget what the word I'm talking about is. The other thing is, and the, the other one loses loses their ability while the other one gains more abilities. Right. You're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. So a major part of evolution, which we tried to explain to Bread of Life, uh, Dapper and I did not too long ago, is that evolution's not all about gain. And in fact, a lot of evolution involves losses. And so uh, in essence, um, yeah, as you, as, you, as you said, as you pointed out, um, when you want to make one feature more prominent, you have to make other features less prominent by, by contrast. You have to basically give up uh, you have to redistribute your your energy and your your met your metabolism to allow for this feature at the cost of others, and so that happens. Yeah, that's that's extremely common in evolution. That's how we get different features. Um, and creationists, you know, will say, "Oh, well, since it's loss, it's not evolution," which isn't true. Uh, adaptation requires loss a lot of times. Parasites, for instance, the more. Um, the more adapted a, a a parasite is for a particular host, typically the more they lose. So in some cases, you have like parasites which have lost their whole nervous systems, right? That's happened with uh, certain Nidarians and with um, uh, barnacle with certain barnacles. I think I think a couple of different groups of barnacles have like gone parasitic and they've lost their nervous system um there is a uh there's a nidarian that lost it's like mitochondrial genome which is pretty crazy so it doesn't even so do like, aerobic so like that they can't even function unless they're on a host then at this point yeah exactly they're, they they just have no way to function except by sucking the life out of the host yeah, it's yeah. Ad adaptive evolution does not ev in necessarily involve getting more complex. It's always a trade-off. Yeah, I, I, I think I forget where it was, but somebody made a point of this in the, another video. Is it, some engineers says if this was if stuff was designed, it would be less complex, not more complex, because engineers like less like like less stuff that like engineers like simple designs, not complicated designs. Right, exactly. Yeah, the hallmark of design is simplicity, not complexity. You make a house using the fewest parts. You make a computer using the fewest parts. That you you don't jerry rig, you know, a computer from an iPad. But that's what we have with evolution: is this constant jerry rigging of of different pathways, like we saw with the. Um, with the the, uh, the the urinary and digestive tracts earlier and the reproductive tracts. Like, we start with one that has to separate into multiple tracts. Why make it that way? <laughs> if it's, why not just make them as separate tracts, right? Um, and so, the, and you know, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, about half of us humans have gained adaptive range by losing the bitter taste reflex that enabled us to eat green veggies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, RJ. Yeah. Also, you brought I think was, you brought this up before the 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 cord of the, the that giraffe cord. You know that that what's it? What's oh yeah, the, the the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Yeah. Yeah, but I, but I didn't think about this earlier. Early, but Dapper brought up a point about that. If the, if the giraffe had it bad, what about the sauropods? Yeah. Um. I think a paper did it on. I think it was Supersaurus, which is one of the longest diplodocoids known, and it would have had a laryngeal nerve of 92 feet 92 feet because it had to go from the brain all the way down to the heart then all the way back up the neck so that's a that's like a 45 foot neck 
in both directions. Well, 40, you know, what, 46 foot neck in both directions. So, yeah, that's an insanely long nerve for what? All to go of, like what? A few inches, you know, because all because our our vertebrate answer had to have it wrapped around the heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like it goes. You would only need it to go like seven inches, you know, something like that uh, in humans, I think, uh, which, you know, would also wouldn't be super long. Um, and creationists really don't have any argument against this. They say. Well, that's the way it develops in, you know, as uh, in your embryonic development. Well, like, yeah, that's that is the way it develops. Yes. But why? Why because is our, that the way? Because our common designer designed it that way. It's like it doesn't have to be. Um, it, it doesn't have to be our designer super wanted, long. Our designer wanted to wrap around our heart and go 20 feet. I guess. I, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's yeah, it's it's many times longer <laughs> than it needs to be, um, simply because it would be maladaptive to try to break that root. Um, so, so I, I, again, I know we can't uh, look at much. Can we look at? Can we look in? Can we look inside eggs? Fossilized eggs and see what was inside them or not? Uh, that depends. There was actually a, a theropod discovered uh, recently that was like an embryonic theropod, or it was, I think it was an oviraptor. I don't know if you, if, you saw, if you saw the press release on that. Um, so yeah, sometimes if they're very, very well preserved, we can. We can look in a few, but not super often. I guess cause, well, I, I, like, cause I know somewhere in our mammal ancestry, because it was both us and the, uh, and the monotremes have reduced oaks yolk sacs i just wonder where if we could figure out where in that line between the synapsids and and the mammals that the oak started to disintegrate or disappear i would be very surprised if we could find that i think it'd be cool but i'd be very surprised to find it not saying it's impossible though yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah like i said that's the one thing i wish we could do with with especially with the the discovery of you know the quote quote blood cells quote 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 right yeah that we, that they, they say it's fresh but we know it's not that that we could we, we could get dna from it that could actually compare you know more get more of a more accurate biology but you know dna isn't that well, eligible for keeping I, around if, if uh if you remember from the um the, the proteins, the collagen they sampled from that T-Rex, it was very similar to avian collagen yeah, because, we, we, of course, we, birds yeah. are dinosaurs, right? Yeah, we you all know? knew that. At least we knew that. Right. And that's that's part of the thing that the creationists won't talk about. They just literally won't talk about it. Um, like, oh, it got preserved. Yeah. What was it most similar to? Birds. That's weird. I wonder why that is. No, no, they don't. They just they say it got preserved. End of story. Therefore, creation, because it creationists don't care about um, they don't care about the facts. They just care about the narrative. Because so. because because the iron couldn't have preserved it for sixty five million years, give or take. It, it's it's because it's a lot younger than we think it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the funny thing is, I read uh, in preparation for a video uh, I did on Paul Paulagia's channel, uh, also with Dapper Dinosaur. I read this paper by these creationists where they said nobody, no serious challenges have been made to the iron preservation hypothesis. So these creationists will admit in the regular scientific literature that the iron preservation hypothesis works. And then they turn around and tell the other creationists, oh, no, it doesn't work. It's, it's not true. Don't believe it. And it's like, whose side are you? You know, whose side are you on? Like, what what's happening here? Is this a? It's it's one of those things where it's like, at some point, you just kind of wonder how much of it is a grift. You know, it's, it's the same thing with the the baremanology. Really, is is they don't believe in evolution, but they have to save some evolution because you know too many people on the, too many, not enough animals on the ark thing, type of thing. Yeah, well, so I feel kind of differently for like Todd Wood and Kurt Wise. Um, and the reason I feel differently for them is it almost it really does seem like they're trying 
Like they they are actually struggling to to deal with the fact that they can't just divide everything into nice little subsets. Um, and and they'll admit that they're like, "Yep, Australopithecus sediba is in the human kind," and they know the other creationists hate that. And they're like, "Look, it's what the data says," and you gotta feel for them, you know. <laughs> You gotta feel for them. I guess they had to say that they, they're they're the they're the, the people that they're the ancestors that didn't get on the ark. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Unless, I, I, unless unless they came from one of the Noah's three kids. I mean, it's like you know. On the one hand, I feel a little bad for them, um, but at the same time, I'm like, look, they admit outright, yeah, uh, evolution's probably true, but I'm not gonna believe it. So it's or like, like yeah. up to, or it's true up to a point. Like, well, they're like uh, they say, um, you know, oh, the Bible is true, and the Bible says the Earth is ten thousand years old, which it doesn't. But you know, whatever. So yeah. So you, it, it, let's come up up your channel besides the more of the ancestor tale stories. Um. Hmm. Let me think. Are we interviewing anybody? I don't think so. I don't think. Uh, oh, I, I do have. Well, I have a potential debate with Otangelo um, on the mm -hmm. 29th, which I know. Woe is me. <laughs> but um, but uh, so that maybe with he's feeling a little under the weather right now. So we'll see um, if that debate's still going to be on. Maybe. Um so that'd be on the 29th on, I think his name is MC Toon, T-O-O-N. Uh, he does a lot of Flat Earth debates, apparently. So it'll be hosted on his channel. So is he pro-flat? No, I think he's anti-flat Earth. Or okay. he's, he's a realist, we'll, we'll say that. You know. I think the Steropodon, yeah, uh, the Steropodon is actually in the Monotreme group, or in the, the Prototh area group. Or Australis Finita, whichever you term you prefer. I don't doesn't. I don't have a a, a side on it. Oh, you, oh, you see, you get the twenty ninth. Uh, when your time yeah. it is January twenty ninth. Right, 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 right uh, not offhand. I don't remember what time it is. Um, okay. Pro, okay, then I might have to reschedule something then, because I, I was hoping to have you on to talk about the uh, the. Uh, or 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 diff or dissian. Oh, the Ordovician. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, I can I can reschedule that. Maybe because we also have to see whenever Colton's available. Yeah, yeah, because uh, of his schedule. Yeah, but with his with school, because um, I know he's in class right now and he's got a bunch of work he's yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. Also, I I was watching I I, re I was watching your debate with or discussion with Bread of Life with on, on your channel and then later on when Dapper rebroadcasted it. That yeah, most of, most of the things he was saying was like. Uh, that's not the topic. Let's stick to the topic, and what technically it was the topic, but kind of not. But, um, yeah, I mean, I made the mistake of for, at first is I, I sent everyone the wrong paper, which I mean, that's my bad, but she just kept God, she just kept saying, Oh, that's not the topic, that's not the topic, that's not the topic. And I was like, Okay, look, I, I, yeah, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, let's let's deal with this paper. And, and she was like, <laughs> Oh, well, I said, you know, you said we were coming here to talk about this. And I was like, let's just get to the paper. My goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, what's, that, this, what's, what's kind of refreshing f for some creationists that it, like to go off topic, you know, but also kind of what's the topic at the same time? And the thing is, she didn't even understand the topic. She did not understand. She asked. She kept asking these like basic questions about the paper. She was like, I read it but I don't understand this. And so we just explain what the paper said, but to her, and then she would be like, Oh, okay. And then she'd move on to the next thing and then ask the same question. She did that. We did that for like an hour where we just talked about this paper. And then at the end she was like, okay. So they figured out it was these genes that were involved in the switch to multicellular to macroscopic multicellularity. And Dapper and I were like, yes, she goes, okay. But it was just a lab experiment. It wasn't in the wild. We were like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, yeah. And also, about, about the, 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 brought up the, the, the beginning of the point. You're like, like you agree with this, like, like uh, you agree with this, 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 this. So why don't you believe in evolution? Like, why well, don't talk about that? Yeah, no. Um, 
no, it's, and the thing about it was, um, I don't know. I don't know how much of it is a grift to her. Um, because the, the thing Dapper asked her, which was very pertinent, which of course she didn't answer was what would you expect for like, like to occur in the lab to consider evolution true? And she was like, uh, Oh, I would, you know, I'd prefer not to answer that, or I don't really have an answer or something like that. But she didn't answer. She dodged the question. And at that, basically, at that point, we knew this was going to go south because without an idea of, if you go into a topic and you're like, I don't believe this thing, and somebody asks you, okay, what would you expect for the, if this thing were true, and you don't have an answer, you have not thought about this topic, and so. She was the embodiment of the deer in the headlights look. Yeah, she was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a very frustrating talk. That was one of the most frustrating talks I've had with a creationist, like, ever. Um, even, even, even more than Nephilim Free? He, yeah, I mean, Nephilim Free's an idiot. Um, but just... It was on par with that. I'll say that. It was on par with a Nephilim Free uh, chat. <laughs> um uh but um yeah no it was, it was a total waste of time um I, I don't have any intent to like talk to her again about evolution because i don't there's no point she's not interested in in learning about it so whatever yeah, yeah. well besides uh that i also once once we get you know uh colton scheduled thing there's also another thing i want I, i'd like to do an episode on in the future and that's if we can and that's wings on well, the uh the conversion evolution of wings and different clades yeah like the we, we know it can't happen in the insect the insect clade then mm -hmm. that's different than the pterodactyl clade was different than the dinosaur bird clade which is different than the, the bat mammal clade which is different than the sphinx pegasus clade yeah um Interestingly, birds uh, are well very close to the birds is a group called the Scansoriopterigids, which is which is a mouthful. But this this clade, uh, or the, I think it's a family, Scansoriopterigidae, they actually develop bat like wings or oh. pterosaur like wings. So they had feathers, but they also had membranous wings, and they're very close to the birds uh, in within Manoraptora. So very weird. Um, the first member of that, or the, the first bat winged uh, Scansoriopter rigid was discovered in like 2015. So that gives us hints at a, a whole ecological system that existed that we now know from like two fossils. You know, how many others developed wings like this? We have no idea. Yeah. And I, I know we'll get more to it when we go into the episode, but it's like, if if like the Pegasus and the Sphinx had to be true, they had to develop wings like the insects did almost off their back and you know well like, like the... because they'd have to be well so they they have um like bird wings they have theropod wings right yeah um but they don't have the like the shoulder girdle for for wings right yeah. so um yeah they'd be the first hexapods uh yeah. rather than than. So, so I remember you brought up wings in your in your discussion with her almost, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh at some point we may have we because after we talked to her about the paper, um Dapper uh, talked to her for quite a bit. Um because she said something like, Oh, you think mutations um, you know, are a major factor in evolution? And then Dapper proceeded to give like this laundry list of different mutations and their effects. And she was, and then at the end of that, she was just like, well, I just don't believe it. Yeah. Or something like that. And I was like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah like, when we do that, I like to have Brain Bug in here because he is more of the insect expert. But like, like how yeah. I think their wings are, at least from my, I, I might be wrong, but they're not connected to any limbs, the, the insect wings and stuff. They're not really limb connected. Right. So the, the tissue for the insect wings. So there were two different hypotheses. There were basically the like, it was a, or well, there were, there were more than two, but. Um, one of the ideas was like their outfoldings of the the dorsal um, ep uh, epidermis, and then another was like they were part of the the leg branch. And it turns out it's kind of both. 
There's okay. like skin or cells from the leg and the back are recruited to make the wings. And so, so yeah, so it turns out it's a little bit of both uh, in the developmental department. Yeah. You know, of all the mythical animals, uh, well, I know that technically rhinos are the unicorns now, nowadays, but you know, mm -hmm. would be unicorns. I think the the, the one thing almost like it might be might be might could have happened because all it is like the little like whatever rentals happen on the on the in their forehead. So they, they could... well, that's like a elasmatherium. Elasmatherium has the the big horn on its forehead, you know. So that could be the the unicorn uh, because uh, what is it? I think the white rhino is Diceris unicornis, if I remember correctly. Is that the one that that came extinct recently, or is that another one? I think dangerous. that was like the the western black rhino or something like that. Okay. Or northern black rhino, one of those. Yeah. Very recently, I think it was the only surviving male or female in the in their family. Yeah, I think it's down to like, it's I think it's two females are basically all that's left, so they're effectively extinct. <laughs> so yeah. well, if you can figure out some way to crossbreed them with other rhinos, probably not. Probably not. Well, I mean, maybe, but it's it's kind of like what uh, happened with the the tortoises and. Uh, one of those, one of the Galapagos tortoises, um, where they're like one of the subspecies, whatever, went extinct. But it turns out that they also interbred with a different subspecies. So some of their um, genes are preserved. Uh, and there was also uh, what is it the the red wolf here in in the United States, uh, which sort of crossbred with like gray wolves and whatnot. So there's still some red wolf um genetic or genes uh but they've also been bred with with gray wolves so they're not not purely red wolves anymore uh, before we let uh, we let you go i just one question I, I, I um i don't know if you i don't know if you saw uh david's debate with Ken, kenny no let's go well he tried to bring up uh, uh, why did not ken well kent you know he like uh totally Brought the topic off, but he brought up a topic that I didn't really not know. I, di I didn't know about. Well, there are three kinds of natural selection: disruptive, uh, stabilizing, directional. and directional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you talk about those a little bit? Because I, I didn't, I didn't even know about that. Yeah, uh, and unlike, unlike Ken, Kenny boy, I, I'm actually interested. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can talk about that. Um, okay, so, so. Natural selection it is, you know, the, the reproductive differential success of a population. And um, directional, stabilizing, and disruptive selection refer to the direction the population goes towards a particular set of alleles, so some norm. Directional selection is sort of the easiest to understand. It's basically you have your original phenotype, and then you have a, a novel allele which arises, and your population drifts towards or gets selected towards that novel phenotype because this new allele is better than the other existing alleles. So you shift sort of unidirectionally towards this new phenotype. So that's directional. It's in like one direction from old phenotype to new phenotype. Okay. Um, so that's, that's sort of the basic one when people normally talk about natural selection. Stabilizing selection... Um, is you have a norm, uh, you have a, a normal phenotype, which works very well in a particular environment. And basically any variations from this norm are going to be selected against. So if you are, I don't know, you know, talk about the platypus. If we're talking about the platypus and you're a platypus and you have a mutation which knocks out some of your electroreceptors. Well, that's not going to be good for you because you rely on those very heavily for your subsistence. So you're, that's going to be selected against. And then disruptive selection is you have one original phenotype and then you have two novel phenotypes, both of which are selected over the original. And it's uh, let me think of an example. Um, imagine if you have so you have an original population and they are basically becoming there. You distribute them over this environment. And within this environment, there are sort of micro environments where you have sets of selective pressure or sets of selective pressures that are different. So you have your original 
and your population sort of distributes over this this particular habitat. And in these areas where you are subject to new pressures, those are going to favor different phenotypes over the original. And so disruptive means you're going from one to two. And this is what happens a lot of times with like um, with cladogenesis. So you have your original species and then they move to different regions and they undergo different selective pressures, which lead to two different species. So that's allopatric uh, okay. speciation. So yeah, kind of like the language from French, from a t from a Latin to French, they would throw. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it became like um, it became French. Uh, it's Italian, uh, Spanish, Romanian. It went in all these different directions. That's kind of disruptive. Yeah. So yeah. And stabilizing, stabilizing that that'd be kind of like the balance between natural and sexual selection type thing. Yeah, sort of. Like, uh, they, yeah. they want to, they want to look good for their mate. They also want to, to not get eaten or something. Right. Exactly. You're you're trying to hit on a particular norm which accomplishes both, essentially. And so yeah, and then yeah, directional is just um, you know new phenotype evolves or, or appears, and then it sort of outcompetes the others, and like, then who like, that one? Like the. Neck, like the giraffe of necks, and the no, the giraffe of ne neck of giraffes, and the 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 tail feathers of peacocks. Right, or the the peppered moth example. They the whole population switched, or went from being like very small percent uh, black morphs, very large percent white morphs, to very large percent um, black morphs, very small percent white morphs. So yeah, but Jackson, they're still moths. They are still moths. That is true. But yeah, that's directional selection. But yeah, I mean, look, these are <laughs> these are very basic, um, you know, population uh, genetics uh, ideas, and you're expecting Kent to know them. That's the first problem. So, <laughs> yeah. well, not just not not just Kent, really. Any most of them. At this point yeah, of point. I mean, Kent's Kent's been repeating the same talking points for what forty years now, something like that. If it's not if, if it wasn't something he learned back in the 1980s, he's not going to use it now. So, <laughs> well, for me coming up next week, I'm going I'm going I'm having venerable bead on to talk about Edward the Third. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, anybody, anybody else have any questions about my dreams or anything that we talked about? RJ Pixie, any questions about? about this topic or the other two guests we have the thing for for we any questions for we, we say goodbye from the peanut gallery <laughs> it's cold as drop below freezing where i am that's probably it's, it's, I, I just blow freezing where i'm at too but it's 20 degrees right now in dang Vendelia. it's colder where you are than where i am oh Brainbug finally showed up. Brainbug, you missed the show. You'll have to catch up. Uh, yeah, we're about to wrap it up. Unless you want, unless you have a thing you want to talk about about insect about monotremes or insect wings. We talked about monotremes. We talked about insect wings. We talked about how they're well, different from their if he wings. wants to talk about insect wings, he'll have to be there for the 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 flight yeah. show. Yeah, start over. Start over. Oh, all right. All right. So we're going to talk about monotremes today. That monotreme means no. <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, I had fun. Thank you for having me on as always. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Yeah. We got to get together with, figure out where, where figure out when uh, Colton's free. And, and then we got to do the, uh, get a, when you're not debating our good old friend, the tab. Hopefully, hopefully Tommy, hopefully your brain's not, dead after your intensive debate we can talk about the, the artificians and the wings later on yeah yeah that's that's true that is true yeah so. well right you know what you say in the end of, end, of, end of your stuff all right uh well thanks for watching and we'll see you next time all right and as i say never stop learning and for the randomness We'll see you then. Bye.